Well, good morning. A simple question. Are you expecting? It can be a tricky question if you ask a woman. Get it wrong, it can be embarrassing and, and downright offensive. But it's actually a pretty interesting question when you walk into church for worship. What are you expecting when you come to church? Some songs and a message? To see some friends? Maybe inspiration or, or comfort? Or some biblical insight? Or maybe it's just motivation to keep on living the Christian life? Or maybe you expect to be challenged? But at most, you probably expect to hear the gospel, this grace and forgiveness of God. The question is, do you expect God to show up? Because he just did. Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood. I showed up here again for you to forgive you. And it's Palm Sunday, and Jesus is entering Jerusalem, and people are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he, the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the road is lined with people who had traveled from Galilee, and people who came to celebrate the Passover every year. Because Jesus had been preaching and teaching there. He had done, done miracles there and, and gained a following. Now, they'd all grown up hearing the story of the Passover. And wherever they could, every year they would travel to celebrate the Passover all together. And they'd grown up hearing that the promised Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior King, would come at Passover. And Jesus had gained this following of people who believed that he actually was the coming Messiah. He'd walked on water and fed 5,000. They'd come to believe he's got to be the one. And they all knew that the Messiah, when he came, would come to Jerusalem to establish the kingdom of God there in Jerusalem, like his father David. In fact, part of the celebration of Passover Jewish people today is they set an empty seat at the Passover table because perhaps Messiah will come at Passover this year. And they're there expecting Jesus to come to be the Messiah. And on top of that, there's this news that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. So there's a buzz. There's a buzz in the crowd as people are sharing the story, and they are expecting. They're expecting the kingdom of God to be established at this Passover, and so they're, they're full of anticipation and, and excitement. And the disciples, they're at the center of it all. Man, they've been following for three years. The parade, make him king, make him king, da, da, da. They're, they're, they're loving this. They're just walking down the streets with Jesus. They're even debating along the way who's going to be the greatest in the new kingdom of God. But wait a second. Jesus had told them what to expect. It says he took the 12 aside and told them, we're going to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. I will go to Jerusalem, suffer, die, and rise on the third day. But they weren't thinking about that. No, not, not that day, not that Palm Sunday morning. They're caught up in the emotion of the moment, caught up in the stuff right in their face. And isn't that often how we pray? We pray about the stuff that's caught right up in our face. We pray about the stuff that's the emotion of the moment. We pray about the things that we need right now. The crowd of the disciples had no idea what was going to unfold that weekend. And when we pray, perhaps our expectations are limited to what's on our mind or what's going on in our life at this exact minute. And we almost pray like, if my will be done, God, and you better do it right now because this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm feeling. God, show up in my world. This is my need. Do it now. But Jesus knew. He was expecting well, no one else expected. He knew that there was a bigger story than just the emotional moment. There was this upper story, this plan of God to save the world. Jesus was fulfilling God's plan to save the world from sin, but in a way that no one actually expected as they're walking into the town on this Palm Sunday, but in a way that perfectly completed God's entire messianic promise and plan. No one expected, actually, the Messiah to be the Son of God. No one expected Jesus to be crucified as a sacrifice for sin. 
And no one expected Jesus to rise again on Easter. But God was showing up in this messed up, sinful world. He was showing up to bring hope and love. And as John said, life, abundant life. Life as it was intended to be. Life in all of its fullness. And everything was happening according to plan. So let me ask you again. Are you expecting? When you pray, are you expecting that God is going to show up in your messy, sinful world? So since Ash Wednesday, we've been talking about praying. We've been learning about it, reading about it, thinking about it, talking about it, praying. That that prayer is not some lucky charm where I can sort of grab the genie and get what I want out of God if I say the right thing in the right way. It's not some magical formula to get what I want out of God. It's about a relationship, a a conversation with God where I begin to trust him to lead and guide and direct me. We talked about how prayer is is traveling with God, that that it's always a precursor to action, that prayer is followed by things that we do, that it's the fuel of life when I feel empty. I I have the strength in this conversation with God to keep me going, that it's a, a prayer I stand in the middle between God and other people. I intercede for people. And the Why Pray devotional book kind of challenged us to perhaps think about prayers differently. And it got me to thinking. I wonder if perhaps we give lip service to prayer, but we only half-heartedly believe that someone or, or something is actually listening. We doubt and question whether or not anything is really going to happen. So most of the time when we pray, We don't expect much. Today we want to shift that thinking. Because this is a week that teaches us a lot about people praying. The prayer is a way, in a way more powerful than what we can imagine or want to admit. And sometimes the answers are not at all what we expected. And Holy Week's this powerful example of God doing much more than we expect. The kingdom of God came, but it was very different than the way they expected the kingdom to be, the king to be, the messianic kingdom to arise. It was a very different way. Jesus flipped the whole story of their expectations upside down. Now each one of you could tell stories of going through roller coasters in life. And over the years, you can tell stories of mountaintop experiences when God answered prayer and incredible things happened beyond your wildest dreams and you saw God at work and you felt the love of God and you felt his presence. We can also tell of of challenging and difficult times and valley times when you feel yourself crying out like King David did in Psalm 22, like, like Jesus quotes from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And often these times of prayer are more about building our relationship and our trust in God than the actual answers we get to our prayers. Sometimes the prayer is more about the relationship than getting what I want. And in fact, very often if you follow the Bible story, it's the lessons learned along the way that are more important. It's the lessons people learned from the time they left Egypt till they got to the promised land, learning to trust God than actually getting to the promised land. That sometimes it's in our prayer along the way that God's trying to open our eyes to see what he's actually trying to teach us. Parts of our heart he's really trying to shape and mold and change, especially in times when we feel forsaken. And can you imagine the, the, the prayer life of the disciples this week? First, they go to sleep on this Palm Sunday night, and they're all full of expectation, and there was a parade, and he's going to be king, and they're, they're excited, and they can't get to sleep that night, expecting all that's going to happen. And their expectations of the kingdom of God were unfolding before their very eyes. Jesus had finally allowed them to call him Messiah. Throughout the time, he says, shh, don't tell anybody yet. My time hasn't come. But that day when the Sanhedrin says, hey, tell you these people to stop saying Hosanna, Jesus said, if they don't say Hosanna, the stones are going to cry out. The kingdom of God is here. Let them call me Messiah. And the disciples are going, yeah, finally, here we go. But then there's Thursday night. 
and the sort of intimate conversation and prayer around the Passover about love and, and the relationship between God and, and this new covenant. It's followed by Thursday night and Friday and Saturday and Sunday morning. What were Jesus' prayers that week? Luke tells us that Jesus cries as he sees the city of Jerusalem coming into town. Comes over the crest of the hill. He's got tears in his eyes. He says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. If you only understood the promises of God fulfilled in this place called the Jerusalem, how the temple is a picture of me, how the sacrifices are a picture of me, if you only knew what would bring you peace. But, but you don't see. And just for fun, what was Jesus' first act as king? Because there would be no better time to start a revolution. Religious fervor is running high. It's Passover. It's Passover. Their history, their heritage. They totally outnumber the Romans and the numbers of Jewish people there. It'd be a great time to start a revolt. So does he go to Herod and say, hey, sorry, you're, no, 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 boo-boo, your days are numbered. I'm about to take over. Does he have secret meetings to sort of plan the battle? Does he host a fundraiser? He did something unexpected. He goes and he clears out the temple. This, this courtyard where people are supposed to be open to pray to God that's now a marketplace, he clears it. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. It's supposed to be where people connect with God here. He cleans it out. And he connects these two great themes in one event. The idea that the Messiah is king. And that the Messiah is the, the substitute, the sacrifice, the, the suffering servant who would die in the place. And then there's Jesus' prayer that night in the garden. And for me growing up, for some reason, my, my favorite image of Jesus was, was Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane. The, the statues and pictures on the wall, that always kind of captivated me. So when I actually got to go there and stand in the garden, it looks like this today. Just so you know, those trees are only about 600 years old. They're not like from the original. They maybe think they came from the originals back then, but, but you're here in the garden. And across the valley, you see the city of Jerusalem. It was kind of emotional for me just to, to be there and imagine what was going through Jesus' brain, what his thoughts, what his prayers were about that night. He was praying that there would be nothing that would separate me from the love of God. He was praying there about completing God's plan to save the world, to forgive sin. And Jesus was very clear about what he expected to happen what the next day would bring. So he's there gearing up to face the, the brutality of the flogging and the crucifixion. And he's there gearing up and preparing for this moment of hell when the Father will turn his back and he will be abandoned, literally forsaken, because our sins are upon him. And he prays, not, not my will, but yours be done. He knew what was expected of him, he was expecting the pain and the suffering, but he chose to do it. His prayer was followed by action. He followed the plan, and he became the king. Just not like anyone expected. And our relationship in this idea of prayer about sitting on a granddad's lap driving the tractor, it shifts on this day. Because God came to earth to die. Jesus came to Jerusalem to be the sacrifice for sin, to guarantee that, that we are forgiven, that God will declare us to be holy so that our relationship with God can't be separated by our mess-ups or our sin. And that night invites us to pray and, and pour out our hearts to God and ask the almighty creator of the universe. And because of Jesus, he, God, he listens to me. He listens to you.
that God is at work in our prayers even when the outcome is not what we expect. In fact, sometimes when God answers, the plan is very different than we expect or want or desire. But its purpose is, all, purpose is always the same, kind of to, to draw us to a place where we trust in him, where we believe in Jesus. Sadly, I think we're really good at forgetting who we're talking about when we pray. That we're talking to the God who made everything we have and everything that we love. The God who spoke and there was light and darkness and mountains and oceans and, and plants and animals and, and us. The God who made us in his image. The God who set in motion a plan to guarantee the forgiveness of our sins so that nothing could separate us from his love, nothing could keep us apart. That God who loves me like that that's who I'm talking to when I pray. We're talking to, to Jesus who went to the cross, who, who followed up that night of prayer by going and dying to sacrifice himself to guarantee the forgiveness of my sins. I'm talking to that Jesus when I pray. Jesus says I, I can be free from the hurt that I've dished out. The stupid words, the stupid decisions that I've made that, that sort of engulf me with a sense of, of guilt and shame for stuff I wish I could do over, go back and undo. It's this story, we watch the story of a God unfold before us, the God who proved how much he loves us. Next time he will celebrate. It's not what we expected, the tomb is empty. Jesus actually did defeat sin and death and the power of the devil, and he actually is alive. So when I pray, I've got the living Jesus with me when I pray, the Holy Spirit of God with me when I pray, speaking in words I don't even understand from the depth of the needs of my soul. Sadly, I think too often we take God and we put him in a box. We limit what God can do. We put limits around what we expect God to show up or do and how God can work. We ask little, and we expect little. So let me remind you again. We are praying to God who has no limits. And so the challenge at the end of this sermon series is pray with faith, expecting the unexpected. Expecting God to show up and do things even when we don't understand what or why. Expect that God is at work inside of our hearts and lives to trust him more, even when we're despairing and lost and broken. So do you expect God to show up when you pray? In James 1 it says this. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Well, honestly, I doubt. I, th I think we all do from time to time. Maybe it's one of my own personal challenges that when I don't get what I want or what I expect from God, when I don't see God showing up like I expect him to show up, I wonder if my prayer is accomplishing anything. I wonder if maybe God's plan is bigger than my little petty life and he's got bigger things to worry about than my little stuff. Or maybe at worst, I wonder if God is real and I'm just speaking to the wind. And then I come back to this week. Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter. I believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who rose from the dead. I believe it. The prayer is expecting the unexpected because we believe in Jesus. And all the Old Testament lesson that we read, it's in Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. 
Welcome to Christmas. That's what Jesus did. God said, I will burst from the heavens. I will come down. Watch me. You will see God in human form. Watch, listen, see who I am. See what he does. See how he sacrifices himself to save us, to guarantee this relationship. Oh, that you would burst through the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake at your presence as a fire sets wood to burn and oil to boil. Your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectation. And Jesus did come down. And nothing we expected to happen that weekend on Palm Sunday actually happened. He did much more than we ever thought or imagined. This awesome deed of God sacrificing himself to free us from sin. It's beyond what anything anybody expected. It's exactly the perfect thing that Jesus came to do. That's why he is our king. And now he wants to rule our hearts with forgiveness and peace. One of my favorite passages is in Romans chapter 8. We hear these words that Paul says, For I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Are you convinced that Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose again? And say yes. That wasn't very convincing. Are you convinced that Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose again? Yes. Do you pray like that? Convinced. Because look what God did to those disciples. He, he takes Peter and all of his stumbling and bumbling and he becomes the leader of the new church. And every one of those disciples gives their life to proclaim the story, what they saw, Jesus alive. That this unexpected flip from Palm Sunday to Easter changed their life dramatically, and they went on to live their lives to tell the story, to live this love of God, to share the forgiveness that they had been given. And this morning, we expect God to be at work in us. I believe God sees the potential in each one of you, and he has high expectations for the gifts and personality and things that you have done and you can be and you can do to impact the kingdom of God. He has high expectations for the stuff he's poured into you. He has high expectations for us as a church. So let's pray that people's hearts and minds will be moved to faith in Jesus. Let's pray that people come and hear Dan kick it out of the park next week on a Sunday sermon of Easter to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Let's let them hear the story of who Jesus is. Let's pray that we launch this, this godly movement of the gospel in us and, and through us as a church to this community around us. They begin to see there is a movement of God as the love of God is happening. Let, let's ask God and expect him to show up and make this movement happen of the gospel in the world that so desperately needs it. Let's pray that as we come out of this whole pandemic, we, we reconnect with each other in, in open, honest, real communication, hold each other accountable and inspire each other to hang on, that we, we love one another and forgive each other. We say, I'll stand beside you till heaven comes. And we're committed to each other as a community of broken sinners who all grab hold of Jesus. See, it's Holy Week. Like, this is our time. This, this is the story that brings us here to worship every Sunday. This is why we are here. It's the story of Jesus and what he is and what he's done. And people desperately need to know about Jesus. So I say it together. We, we boldly pray and expect God to show up and do unexpected and unimaginable things beyond what we can picture today. And mold us as individuals and as a church who, who truly are a force for the, the Spirit of God. It's not just talking about love, but we move and we love. It's not just talking about forgiveness, but we actually forgive. Just talk about God at work in the world. We, we have God working in us and transforming the way that we live and the way that we speak every day. James 4, verse 2 says, You do not have because you do not ask God. So today we're asking.
Maybe we don't experience the unexpected because we don't ask. So we've talked about prayer. We've learned about prayer. I think it's time to to pray. Because we have a God who is ready, willing, and able to answer. We have a God who has proven his love for us, who invites us to ask, who says, because of Jesus, there's nothing to separate you from my love. So here we are, you're sitting on my lap, like riding the tractor, ask. Pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to call out the best of who you are, and and to speak through you, to use the best of your gifts and talents and abilities to bring the gospel to the world. Ask. Pray boldly with expectation that you will see, that we will see God on the move. So I'm in where I began. Simple question. Are you expecting? I am. Some days more than others. But I'm expecting that God's going to speak to me in the moments of most brokenness. I expect that that fellow Christian people are going to stand with me and love me and forgive me when I need to hear it the most. I expect when we gather for worship, God shows up and and there's a little glimpse of heaven. I expect that every day God's going to give me opportunities to love and forgive someone who doesn't know yet. I expect the movement of God in this place to be something we're excited to be a part of as it begins to transform our lives into something meaningful that matters and forms us into a a community of people where it's not just talk. We join Jesus in the garden and we desk with God. I know what a life following you means and I'm in. Are you expecting? Are 